This is gonna be a very long video. I should get a drink. Simply spiked peach mango. So the idol, I have not had a show in recent memory garner as many requests from you guys, mainly because you guys didn't wanna watch it and apparently you didn't. <laughs> and for good reason, I'm happy you didn't. Hopefully this means there will be no second season. Uh, I saw on HBO Max that they referred to it as a full series. Hopefully that's a hint. And uh, today, we're gonna talk about it. So it'd be really nice if you gave me like a thumbs up of encouragement. I have one nail hanging on and it's just my thumb. Also maybe watch this ad, that'd be great. Hello everyone, this is at Roll Kenny and today's video is sponsored by Care Of. Care Of is a subscription service that ships high quality personalized vitamin supplements and powders to your door every month. You go in there, take a quiz, and it'll curate some supplements that will be best for you based off of your lifestyle. If you are pregnant, if you are vegan or vegetarian, compiles a vitamin pack for you based off of your needs specifically. Organized, easy to remember pack. They also put your name on it and they have like cute little things that they say on it. Sometimes it takes years for a person to become an overnight success. Prince. Thank you, Prince. When doves cry, amen. In my vitamin pack, I have a multivitamin with iron to fill any nutrition gaps from my diet. Fish oil for omega-3s, brain health, heart health. Rhodiola also for brain health, as well as energy and stress management. Of course, you should probably take them one at a time, but as I've always said, I'm a G. And my G. <sighs> Probably shouldn't take them with coffee either. And I also get their whey protein. I love having like vanilla protein on deck. I put it in oatmeal, I put it in yogurt, I put it in baked goods, waffles, muffins, put them in smoothies and shakes. It's just really good to have a good whey protein or if you're vegan, they also have vegan protein. And it's just really convenient to have these supplements and powders sent to you at your doorstep. They're also thoughtfully sourced, research-backed, high-quality ingredients. So you know you're getting something that really fits into a very holistic wellness routine. So if you would like to check out Kara, feel free to check them out using the link down below. And also use my code KennyJD50 for 50% off. Big thanks again to Kara for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery. So like I said, today we're talking about the idol created by Euphorious Sam Levingston. Small editing note, his name is Sam Levin, Levinson? <laughs> but it's actually, for some reason, so hard for me to say, so I keep accidentally calling him Levingston. So if you're like, who are you talking about? That's who I'm talking about. Starring Lily Rose Depp and Abel the Weekend Tesfe. I wanna say Tesfe, but that's not it. And the idol has been getting quite a lot of negative buzz across the interwebs, even before it was released, which dare I say is impressive. And those negative reviews were coming from critics at Kane Film, film, f f f f <laughs> film Festival, as well as people working on set. And now that it's out, it's getting ripped apart by people on the internet, assuming you even watched it, because again, not a lot of people did. Lily Rose Depp plays Jocelyn, a Britney Spears type pop star that has recently made a comeback. After a very hard year, she canceled her tour after having a mental breakdown due to the death of her mother. In that very fragile state, she meets Tedros, who's a local DJ slash club owner slash musical creative advisor slash manager slash cult leader. It's a mess. He's incredibly creepy and off-putting and they enter into this very weird relationship that results in Tedros kind of taking over her life, taking over her house, along with his followers who are people that are under his record label. With the stress of her record label, as well as competition around every corner, will Jocelyn be able to rediscover her voice as an artist and survive her increasingly abusive relationship with Tedros? Again, the show was getting bad critiques before it came out. It's gotten even worse since it has. But I will say that this show got ripped apart in a way that I'm not even particularly used to. I know the internet and the internet loves to hate watch, but people didn't even hate watch the show either explicitly boycotting it because they heard of the vast misogynistic cluster f that it was supposedly supposed to be or implicitly in the sense that just nobody cared because it, it was boring as f 
But with that said, a bunch of cringy clips have gone viral on various parts of the internet. And so that's where I come in, giving you the tea without forcing you to sit there for five hours watching a show that you had no real interest in watching. But if you're curious about what happened, Let's go along for the ride. Today, we are doing, hopefully, a very comprehensive breakdown, a stroll down the mess that hopefully was the idol. Hopefully this is a sign that we will visit this shit nevermore. I recently got a Poe anthology and it, it, it really is filling me with gothic whimsy. So this is gonna be a very long video, as you probably already noticed. If there's anything in particular you wanna check out, use those timestamps and don't complain to me in the comments about how long the video is and how long it took to get to the part that you wanna listen to. So let's talk about Sam Levington. Uh, I don't like Sam. I don't know if I've ever explicitly said that, but for a while, for as long as I've known who he was and how he exists in the world, I found him to be kind of a creep. <laughs> he just gives me weirdo vibes. I don't know him personally, but he just gives me a... If you've been following me for a very long time, you may recall that I made a video, give or take three years ago, where I talked about Euphoria and how I was gonna watch it, but then I watched like half of the first episode and I could not get through it because it was just too many signs that a weirdo made this shit. <laughs> In that video, I kind of explained my thought process. I'll link it down below in case you're curious and you can watch it after this. I had a lot of people mad at me, particularly Euphoria fans. But I feel like since that video, I've been noticing more and more people who are starting to get the vibe that I was going to. Not that I was the only one. There were definitely people who were saying like, yeah, I see where you're getting at because that's the vibe I was getting. There was just so much about the show that I could not ignore because what weird ass dude wanted to make this show? And I think since then it's become a lot more mainstream for people to kind of criticize Sam Levingston. The complaints I'm hearing from people that continue to watch Euphoria is that it just kind of devolved into bad writing and titties. And at some point we just have to accept that that's all it was in the first place. <laughs> With that said, I haven't seen Euphoria, so I, I can't give you specific complaints about the show because I didn't watch it. But from what I see on like timelines and stuff, that is the critique that a lot of people are giving the show. So when I started hearing buzz in, in a negative sense about a new Sam Levingston show and people are already criticizing it, it hasn't come out yet, but it's already being lit aflame for being quote unquote torture porn, misogynistic fodder, pointlessly sexual, badly written, badly performed. None of these things shocked me. <laughs> I was curious if this time they were supposed to be adults. <laughs> and I found out that they were supposed to be adults. And so I decided to say, hey, people again dragged me for not liking his last work. Maybe, you know, if we bump it up to adults, maybe it will be better. And so I decided to go in completely unbiased. Again, I don't like Sam Levingston, but I'm curious if he makes a good work, I'm gonna say it's good. See if perhaps the headlines were a bit too presumptive. I highly doubt they've seen the whole show at that point. Maybe they had some misconception about the overall point of the show, the morality of the show, the objective of the show, what it really has to say. And maybe they're getting distracted by the reality of shocking violence and sex. And maybe they're a bit squeamish. Perhaps under the shock, there's something of value. Again, something that Sam or anybody else wants to say. I, I cannot stress this enough. I plan to be neutral. I had no interest in just going into the show to rip it apart. And even while <laughs> being as tempered as possible, this show sucks <laughs> really, really bad. Really, really bad. Really, really. I also found that the show has completely cemented some suspicions I've had about Levingston, about his work. I also have some thoughts about why he probably really meshed well with The Weeknd because they, they, they scream the same type of person to me. But before we get into that, let's talk a bit about pre-production woes. Because why was it that before the show even came out, people were saying it's a piece of shit? Idol had some pre-release controversies. Several months before the show came out, uh, the Rolling Stones released this big sort of expose about how much of a mess production was on The Idol, why it's continually getting delayed. The Idol, how HBO's next euphoria became twisted torture porn. In this article, sources, people that worked on set, people that left the set because it had gone completely off the rails, they kind of talk about how much of a mess it had been trying to cobble together some type of show called The Idol. Apparently the show was supposed to premiere all the way back in November of 2021, but it was continually being pushed back, reshot, 
rewritten. Um, if you weren't aware, Sam Levingston wasn't supposed to be the original like director of the show. It was supposed to be directed by Amy Simons, who is the co-creator of The Girlfriend Experience and She Dies Tomorrow. And when HBO originally picked up the story, it was supposed to be this incredibly smart and critical and satirical and subversive story, distinctly woman led in this kind of category of women's exploitation and entertainment. Glitter, showgirls, the star is born. You know, they keep making these movies and they're usually directed and created by men. And this was going to be one where a woman is telling the story of a woman's exploitation. Theoretically, she would kind of know being that she'd be a director, i.e. a woman working in entertainment. However, uh, in April of 2022, with approximately 80% of the six episodes already finished and filmed, Simons made her exit, handing over the reins to Sam, resulting in a complete creative overhaul, new cast, new crew. It was rewritten eight trillion times. Simons left for a bunch of reasons, uh, partially because she was kind of set up to fail, suddenly became a writer of the show, even though she was never intended to be. Also, it was said that she had, you know, some creative differences with The Weeknd, who felt that the show was leading, quote, too much into a female perspective. <laughs> the show about the women in entertainment. Yeah, I talked too much about the women in entertainment. Who the fuck is it supposed to be about, Abel? It would seem that this is because The Weeknd wanted more screen time, which is a true tragedy because the rare instances that the show that we end up getting is halfway decent it's always when he's not there <laughs> keep shoehorning him in that bitch because he said i'm gonna get my screen time so when levingston stepped into the role as director they scrapped the nearly finished 54 to 75 million dollar project to recreate it, to rewrite it, to recast it. What we end up with is weakened to the core. It no longer has a core anymore. <laughs> In the place of where there was a message, they just ramp up sex scenes and make them more and more disturbing. It was no longer this kind of dark satire of fame and exploitation and manipulation. It became the thing that it was making fun of. It is now simply a show that revels in controversy, spectacle, spotlight, exploitation. It's no longer satire. It's no longer a joke, babe. Hey, you want to see a woman get exploited? We made a whole show about it. We have nothing to say about that. It's no longer this troubled girl falling victim to her predatory industry figures. Now it's just what HBO referred to as the sleaziest love story in all of Hollywood. It simply became abuse and fantasy. So sources say that again, The Weeknd wanted to have the show more focused on him and his character, uh, told less from a quote unquote feminist lens and less about the cult, which begs the question, what the fuck is the shit supposed to be about? I just feel like if he wanted to make a whole like ego driven bad boy mini series about his character being a creep, that that would make sense how we got whatever this pointless ass show was. I believe it was D'Angelo Wallace that said this show looks like a very, very, very long <laughs> The Weeknd music video. And that is so true. Much in Sam Levinson's style, the, sh the show is beautiful. It looks good. It just isn't good. <laughs> so much of it is just like snippets, a compilation, five hours of The Weeknd music videos, people doing drugs, artistically focusing just on like asses and titties, a lot of skinny white women in heels, you know, a weekend video. And I feel like if he just wanted to auto fellatio himself, he could have asked HBO for like a old time me concert special. It would have been an hour, 45 minutes. We all see your concert and then we can move the fuck on. But you want it five hours, nigga? I genuinely think that the idol is just a very long, expensive exhibition kink that he turned into a show that accidentally got turned into a show with merit and he just could not let that happen. The Weeknd is like co-creator of the show. I think he came up with like the general idea, but the original director and writers turned it into like something like tangible that they can work with and what they came up with apparently he was not okay with. So once they scrapped the old director and they now had Sam, Sam came in and he was totally okay with putting The Weeknd in the center, very okay with doing whatever he wanted with the script, barely letting HBO know what he was doing with the script. And it would seem that both of them kind of had this endless amount of <laughs> self-assurance delusion. <laughs> Maybe The Weeknd felt like he was finally delving into something distinctly separate from him and his music, even though, again, this show ends up being just one long 
the weekend music video. Whereas Sam probably felt completely untouchable with the success of Euphoria. And if they expect to have another season of poorly written minors being topless, they better give him what he wants. With that said, I would like to say that though most of my strongest issues with the show have to do with Sam, but I would like to put a little salt in the wound because it's very, very funny how he's been acting online when people have been saying the show is shit. He was very much so losing the I don't give a fuck award. My personal favorite is where he suggested that people are basically disliking it because they don't have a mind of their own. Rest assured, Abel, people have the ability to say whether or not they like a show. <laughs> We have everything we need to say if we like a show. We just don't. Most people couldn't even make it to the end of the show. I had to power through my guy. We all have L's, just learn to take them. So with that said, let's venture back to Sam. Cause I have, I have some theories, <laughs> if you will. This is more of just like a thought experiment. I feel like now after uh, tangentially seeing Euphoria in the sense that people are kind of complaining about it on timeline, but I didn't watch it myself. And now having seen an entire show by Sam, he strikes me as an incredibly insecure writer. On some level, he knows that he can't make a show. <laughs> he can't make a show. He feels like he has to depend on like low hanging fruit, like controversy, a more and more explicit sex, shock humor, slurs, just being outright gross. I think on some level he knows that he can't make a show that stands on its own merits, its own premise, script, performances, execution. I don't think he, I don't think he believes he can make that. And maybe he knows that he can't get away with a good story, but what he can get away with is hot people and a cool camera angle. And I'll admit it, the show is beautiful to look. If you don't listen to it, if you keep it on mute and skip the sex shit, it's a beautiful show to watch. Literally watch. <laughs> but those beautiful things don't progress a story or build one. It doesn't make it compelling. It doesn't make the characters compelling, their relationship to each other. I think the clip that really solidified this suspicion for me, they were at like that press coverage press junket or whatever when people were asking them about the pre-production ruckus and controversy. He'd said something incredibly obtuse and again indicative of this sort of like swinging pendulum of his insecurity that's overcompensated with his ego. When my, when my wife read me the article, I looked at her and I just, I just said, I think we're about to have the biggest show of the summer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you in for a shock? And I think to some degree, maybe this is what brings The Weeknd and Sam Levinson together. They seem to both kind of have this sort of, this sort of vibe I get. Um, I think that's why The Weeknd is pushing back so hard or was pushing back so hard when people were saying how shitty the show is. But if Sam weren't the type of person, why would he have so many of the things that ended up in the show. So that's assuming it got in the show. I didn't even talk about the myriad disturbing shit that didn't even end up in the show, according to allegations from that uh, Rolling Stones article where apparently she was supposed to put an egg and if it broke or fell out, the weekend's character wouldn't rape her and she starts to spiral because she believes that rape play is the only way to unlock her success. But I digress. If Sam wasn't that type of person, we wouldn't have this mess. I don't believe that Sam believes that he can make a show. And so he tends to heavily rely on inspiration, which is nothing new. Most artists do in some way or another. You get inspired by something and make it your own. And as I was watching it, I was sitting there like, Oh my God, Sam Levingston either wants to be Verhoeven or in a weird way thinks he's Verhoeven and perhaps thinks that when people call out the misogyny and the weird shit that may be, you know, maligned today, but maybe later people will get it. It might find a cult following. If you're not getting the reference I'm making, I'm talking about Paul Verhoeven's Showgirls. So for those of you that are new to me, unfamiliar with my channel, I have a very complicated love affair with Paul Verhoeven's Showgirls, a movie much like this show about about a young woman who is in the seedy, misogynistic, predatory underbelly of entertainment, who is trying to make a name for herself, claim a level of autonomy, and she does this through sex, sexuality, and it's a coke-driven fever dream created by white men that believed in themselves way too much, who were fresh off of the success of Basic Instinct, that genuinely believed they can do whatever the fuck they want. And so they made this campy, garish, confusing, <laughs> jarringly sexual, yet the least sexy thing I've ever seen that is incredibly violent, uh, both literally and kind of in this more 
systematic sense that exists in this strange, uncanny valley that is very divisive. <laughs> and as you can imagine with something so ostentatious as that coming out in like 95, it roused a lot of controversy, understandably so. I personally hated it when I first saw it. I, I have a video on my channel about showgirls and in that video, I fucking hated it. But slowly over time, I found myself mystified by it, intrigued by it. It was this strange, uncanny thing that you can never truly fully understand. It's both about exploitation while being exploitative, things that are over the top while being over the top. It's bad in as many ways as it's good. And as I've heard critics call it, it is a masterpiece of shit. And it's pretty obvious that Levingston seems to be a bit of a Verhoeven fan. There is a clip in this show, which I'll bring up when we get to the actual episode recaps where there's a nod to basic instinct. Also the makeup in Euphoria very much so screams showgirls to me. So I wouldn't be surprised that if on some level he feels like he's making something similar to that. A nod to the crassness of showgirls, the flashiness, the kitschiness. Maybe to some degree he thinks the comedy in the idol and the incessant weird shit. It's peculiar lines and line delivery to some degree is supposed to be emblematic in some way, allegorical to showgirls. And maybe to some degree, he feels like he's being maligned uh, as, as showgirls was when it came out, but eventually found a cult following. But Levingston isn't Verhoeven. Though showgirls is certainly imperfect, in its attempts to have a set message. It's it's obvious that it does have one. <laughs> it's about exploitation, particularly towards women and how in that context, sex can be used as a lot of different things. Currency, performance, survival, social mobility, competition, camaraderie, and it presents it in a rather amoral way. It doesn't shame or glorify it. It is pretty um, explicitly critical of sexual violence. It's critical of men's perpetuation of said violence. Like though it's an imperfect satire, it's still pretty obviously satire. The idol though, it doesn't have anything to say. Best case, it has literally nothing to say. And worst case scenario, it's this weird artistry is found through torture, particularly in a sexual way. And then Mount spoiler at the end, kind of says like, maybe the exploited are the real villains here. <laughs> And then, if that's not bad enough, possibly the most egregious thing about the show is that it's f***ing boring. It's boring as shit. At least, if we're gonna continue this showgirls comparison, at least showgirl is campy as f***. We got some lines. Versace, different places. Dolphin sex. I love doggy chow. Fajitas. The show ain't give a shit. There's nothing enjoyable about this show other than maybe some steel shots that could have just been a weekend album cover and called it a fucking day. It's completely meritless. It's not fun. It's rarely dramatic in a way that's interesting to watch. It's incoherent. It's expensive garbage. Well, Showgirls was also an expensive piece of trash. So I guess in that way, they also have that. When white men feel like they can do anything, they give you a lot of money. <laughs> so now that I've rattled on about the background of the show, the production issues of the show, my varying issues and suspicions around uh, Sam Levingston, a spoiler for Free review again it's not even good enough to hate watch so but if you don't want spoilers that's it let's talk about the show itself <laughs> Episode one. So the show opens with us seeing the main character, Jocelyn, in the middle of a photo shoot in which we get like a close up of her doing varying expressions. And very quickly we learn that the people around her are trash. Take for instance, this woman, this is Nikki. She is a record executive and she's there kind of overseeing the shoot. And Nikki is unapologetically cool with exploiting uh, Jocelyn's fragile mental state, her history of mental illness, and not just exploiting it, but sexualizing it. <laughs> Mental illness is sexy. If you live in Sioux City, Iowa, you are never gonna meet a girl like Jocelyn. Unless she has some very, very serious mental problems. And that right there is why mental illness is sexy. And at first I was like, oh, okay, well that's obviously supposed to be critical of that theoretically, albeit heavy handed as f 
talk writing wise it's supposed to show like how the executives have no end to their exploitation and how they'll do it in any situation and that's a bad thing but as the show goes on i'm not 100 percent sure about that <laughs> so the shoot continues and jocelyn decides that she wants to show her areolas her nipples which is something that can't be done without the intimacy coordinator sending over an update uh to the writer which not going into that whole thing, but essentially it's just a contract that is meant to protect talent from being exploited. Like they have a whole consent form. That's essentially what you agreed to do. No one will force you to go out of that. So it's there to protect uh, all those working on set as well as the talent. And especially considering again, Jocelyn is in a fragile state. Everybody knows that it's doubly important that she's protected. And at first I was very confused about the inclusion of this character. They don't show up in any other part of the show. And I thought, oh, this is great. Maybe this is supposed to be an example of how the team around her don't care about <laughs> her being taken care of. But as the scene continues, they really make this guy genuinely out to be a nuisance and kind of seem to criticize the very concept of an intimacy coordinator, they turn him into like an anti-feminist because she wants to show her nipples, but they're like, it's fine for you to generally, in a general sense, show your nipples, but this, in this sense, we're looking out for you legally. I was like, oh shit, okay. This is what I'm walking into. Jocelyn has a team, as most stars do. Her managers of sorts are Haim and Destiny. She has Xander her creative director, and Leia is her best friend slash assistant. Now, I don't enjoy much of this show, but if I'm gonna enjoy anything, it's probably gonna be a scene with Destiny or Leia. Cause Destiny is actually incredibly funny. I think it's just the actress's delivery cause she's incredibly funny. And then Leia, I love because I really like Rachel Sennett. And she also is very funny in her delivery. A compromising photo of Jocelyn with cum on her face is leaked to the public. The undercurrent of most of this first episode is trying to hide the news from Jocelyn that the photo leaked. So throughout the day they're hiding this news from her as she's continuing with her photo shoot, as she's starting rehearsals, as she's coordinating interviews for her comeback. They're all being like, don't let Jocelyn know. Don't let Jocelyn know that somebody saw her on her face. And the team is losing their mind doing damage control, trying to figure out how to turn this into something that is very sympathetic for her, which is that a spin? Like if someone leaked your photo without your consent, do you have to spin it to make her sound Sympathetic, but okay. Without knowing any of this is going on, Jocelyn goes to do her dance rehearsals. That is where we see her backup dancer, Diane, played by Jenny from Blackpink, who I have yet to mention, if you've noted, but that's because she barely does shit in the show. Um, She's barely there. She has like three lines per episode at best. She ain't never there, but they was like, we gotta get them K-pop fans. While they're dancing, Jocelyn is obviously having some trouble. The show is so well written. They have very subtle references to Britney. With Britney as well, like people count them out. And this is Jocelyn saying, I will not be written off. And that's cool considering Britney Spears is a very real, alive person. One of the like head record executives comes to the house as well. His name is Andrew Finkel, Finkel something, Andrew. And he's at the rehearsal because he's afraid that Jocelyn would not be able to deliver because she had to cancel her last tour when she had a mental breakdown after the death of her mother. She had like a psychotic break. And so he's coming to see how things are going along now that they're gonna try to bring back the tour. So she keeps rehearsing and I suppose this is where I should mention the music. Um, the single is called I'm Just a Freak, Yeah. I'm just a freak, yeah. <laughs> and it's garbage. Granted, it's supposed to be uh, in canon with the show. Uh, it It is bad. It is, <laughs> it's garbage. Some of the other songs are like okay in the show, but one of the aching complaints I have is that every song that plays is so f literal to what's happening it's so weird and it's so funny but eventually jocelyn is informed of the cum pick and on my rewatch i realized i completely forgot about the cum pick because it is not important to the show really but it's not really that much of like a catalyst to the show as much as you would kind of think think it is and when she finds out about it it ends pretty anticlimactically she's like oh it could have been worse and honestly that's it <laughs> and it's just one of the many loose threads that are still there by the end of the show so 
look forward to that. Which by the way, they show the pick and because it doesn't work very well, again, as like a catalyst to anything that happens in the show, I'm just left thinking, Sam, did you just want us to see her with on her face? <laughs> it's so weird. Anyway, after rehearsal, Jocelyn and Diane end up going to a club where they meet Tedros, played by The Weeknd. He is the main DJ of the club as well as the owner. And he spots her as soon as she comes in, but acts like he doesn't see her until later where he shouts her out in the middle of the club saying how much of a fan he is, asks her to dance. It's pretty obvious from the get-go, Tedros is kind of a sleazy dude. He has a rat tail in 2023. He's wearing silk pajamas in the club and they dance together terribly. And this also is feeling very uh, showgirls-esque. And then Tedros, after knowing her for literally 60 seconds, says that he might be falling in love with her. And she's like, I don't even know you. And they end up making out in the back. They talk about her album, about how she hates it, how she thinks it's superficial and not really representative of her. I think this is the first proper scene where we see the weekend act. And it's, it's rough. <laughs> Pop music is like the ultimate Trojan horse. You get people to dance, you get people to sing along, to say whatever you want. It's powerful. I will say The Weeknd isn't terrible the entire show. He really isn't. I think the issue is that he fails in the most important places. When he's supposed to be his most convincing is when he, sh he, he falters. And that's why he looks so bad. <laughs> and it also doesn't help that he has some lines that are truly, there's no way to say them in a way that would make him not look cringy as f while at the club, uh, Leia ends up meeting a guy named Isaac. He's very attractive, but the show is also incredibly fetishy about him. So ew, it, like it's it's really weird. <laughs> uh, him and Leia hit it off, so they start dancing on the dance floor. As a side note, in the club, they play the only version of Peace of Your Heart that should be allowed in any location. I just wanna hear the Alok, is that how you say that? A-L-O-K remix. I don't wanna hear anyone else's version of that song. So after a riveting night meeting this mysterious man, Jocelyn comes home. She touches herself. Okay. <laughs> the next day, Jocelyn finally has that interview with the woman that came to her house yesterday. I don't know where she went. I don't know if she just went home and they had to reschedule for the next day. I don't, they talk about her mom, uh, about the photo. She doesn't really answer how she feels about it either. There is this line that makes me feel like Sam really thought he was he was writing something incredible. And it's it's so funny to me. I don't know why. <laughs> we all have to answer to somebody. What do you answer to? God. Okay. It's it's not the line itself. It's the thought of Sam <laughs> being there like, oh, I'm writing some real shit right now. <laughs> Later that night, Jocelyn and Leia watch Basic Instinct. Again, another nod to Verhoeven and possibly something that they're gonna try to use as a callback for the ending, but it doesn't work. While they're watching it, Jocelyn asks Leia if she likes the song and Leia's like, I like it. Jocelyn is like, I don't like it. I feel like it's superficial. Leia's really supportive. She was like, you're doing a great job. At some point, Jocelyn says that she wants to contact the Tedros guy again, which Leia disapproves of. What's wrong with him? He's so ribby. Yeah, I kind of like that about him. Okay, so she ends up calling Tedros and he comes to the house like fucking Nosferatu. <laughs> this is accidentally the funniest shit they've done in this show. He come in like the Undertaker, <laughs> like his guest character for the Adams family. He comes to the door, greeted by Leia. He kisses her. Um, thank you for that. Uh Weird, him and his blue magic laden rat tail that defies gravity. He plays her piano a little bit. He's obviously supposed to be spooky -ooky. He practices his first greetings to her in the mirror. Hello, Angel. To show that he's a master manipulator. And eventually Jocelyn comes down, they drink together. Eventually she plays him her new song. She wants him to listen because she feels like he's the only person that's enough of an asshole to outright tell her the truth and not say it's good even though it's not. And Tedros listens to it and he says, it's good, but I don't believe you when you say in the sh in the song that you're a freak, yeah. freak, yeah. And he says this while her legs are on his shoulder and he starts putting the ice from his drink on her p 
And ultimately, the episode ends with him basically saying he can bring uh, something else out of her. And he does this by putting her own dress over her face, stopping her from breathing, and she's starting to suffocate. But it ends with him cutting a hole where her mouth is, allowing her to breathe. And it ends with him saying, Now you can say. So that's episode one. Doesn't feel like uh, nothing happened, but everything at the same time feels very long and tedious. Also, be careful with breath play. I don't know if this is gonna like make people be like, oh, I should try it. Be careful. Um, know what you're doing. People can die. Please don't trust just anybody to choke you. Anyway, episode two. So the episode begins with Jocelyn bringing all of her team people to her house for them to listen to the remix of I'm Just a Freak, yeah. Freak, yeah. That she made with Tedros the night before. And the scene is incredibly awkward because the song is not done, but also the song sucks. Oh, you don't really know how to handle it. And she's the only one that seems to be like really into it while the rest of them listen to it and they're like, oh. It's kind of funny but more awkward than funny. And Nikki's like, why why would we throw away the hit that you have? Like, why would we change it? And Jocelyn is like, it doesn't feel authentic to me. And they're like, well, we need you to sell tickets for a concert. Like, why would you throw away the one thing that would definitely get people to come? And she's like, well, fine, then I'll release it myself if you don't believe in it. And this is where Nikki uh, chews her out while also giving us some expository dialogue about her background with Jocelyn, giving the whole spiel about how Jocelyn is on thin ice because she ended up wasting a lot of money for the record company. They asked her when her mom got sick with cancer to cancel the tour so that she could spend time with her mother and she refused. So they kept going and then a week before the concert, she has her breakdown and they waste all that money from the concert because they had to refund everyone for tickets. She talks to Tedros for comfort over the phone as he's getting his rat tail braided. And in the same room is Isaac, who apparently is in cahoots with Tedros, talking to Leia. And Tedros is like, you should be surrounded by people that believe in you. Later, she very aggressively brushes her hair. This is a reoccurring thing. We'll mention this later because <laughs> it's both important but not at the same time. Um, and she gets ready to film her music video. Something that ends up having a very late start because her makeup teen had to airbrush over self-harm wounds on her thighs. And I will say this entire scene is possibly the only scene in the entire show that's any good. I genuinely think this scene is so well done, so heartbreaking, so tangible and palpable how much pressure Jocelyn is under, both from those around her as well as internally for herself. Cause they're at the shoot for the music video and Jocelyn wants to do take after take after take after take, even ones that are okay. She's like, no, I can do it better. I can do it better. I can do it better. And as a perfectionist myself, it was interesting seeing my own neuroses on screen. By the end of it, it feels so tense. Her feet and her thighs are bleeding. Everyone on set is agitated and tired. And you could tell that something, the string is gonna snap and it's a very well done scene. Meanwhile, Destiny and Haim are talking about looking into Tedros because they're like, who is this dude that she worked with to make this weird remix or whatever. So they look into him and apparently he's kind of sketchy. Like there's no information about him. Like he he doesn't exist prior to like three years ago. So Jocelyn does one more take and it's actually perfect. It's the first time that she's actually happy with a take that she's done. After a million takes, she's like, oh my God, I finally got it. But the camera malfunctions and the shot is unusable. And I was heartbroken. I was like, oh my God god oh my god like i felt so much for her and it was the first scene that actually made me feel something i think i think lily rose depp's performance here is so good and right when i'm feeling actually emotionally connected to anyone in the show we have to go back to the f weekend because apparently at the same time while this is happening tedros is making isaac do some weird fetishy horny dance with a shock collar on for a bunch of white women and apparently this is 
to be a star or some shit. I don't know. Okay, so back to Jocelyn because we should have never left because I don't give a f about Tedros. She officially snaps. She starts to have a breakdown and she starts to crumble. She calls out to her mom who again is dead and it seems like she's kind of semi hallucinating. Um, when they ask her like, did you call out to your mom? She's like, no, 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 she died last year. Like I'm okay. And she's obviously barely hanging on. At this point, Nikki is like, hey, let's call it a day. Please go home, get some rest, and we can go again tomorrow. But fear not. In case you thought that maybe Nikki had some humanity, she simply just wants uh, Jocelyn out of the way so that she can replace her with Diane. She noticed that Diane was out dancing everybody. She was wondering if she could sing and then she found out she can carry a tune. So she's like, great, we'll just replace Jocelyn instead. Everyone around Jocelyn is concerned that she can't show up because again, she couldn't show up before and now she's having trouble on set. And she's like, don't give up on me. So she reaches out to Tedros, inviting him over. At this scene, we see that Tedros and Diane know each other. Uh, apparently they had a sexual relationship. So I was set up to believe that Diane is supposed to be some type of rival for Tedros's affection. But again, we barely see her. So <laughs> rest assured, we won't focus on any of the actually interesting story arcs of the show because again, we got to see more of the weekend we can't have a decent show we gotta see the weekend so tedris comes over but not only does he come over he comes over with a bunch of people unannounced uninvited just hella is at her house and she is not confused by that she's not off put by that she's not angry about that she don't kick him out as a celebrity is it not dangerous to just have a bunch of random coming into your house knowing where your house is that's how you get your shit cased one girl who's this weird kind of like pixie like girl her name is chloe and she gets naked immediately and jumps in the pool and jocelyn is just like oh how whimsical and then they start to play a weekend song like an actual weekend song i assume that he did for the soundtrack here which Again, so subtle. If you don't listen, you, you'll you miss it. Uh, and they start to party, they start to drink, they do cocaine, they play piano naked. Leia asks Isaac how um, he met Tedros. This is where we get the first sign that Tedros is interested in, in people who are quote unquote damaged, people that really need him and he, and he preys on people in their weakened state. He's a cult leader in addition to being a DJ, a club owner, a, an artist developer, you know, he's a man of many hats. And the way that Isaac talks about Tedros is very indicative of a person who isn't just um, grateful to somebody, but he sees them as a god. He's completely changed my life. He's transformed me. He's pushed me further than anyone else has. He's really made me better. And Leia is still not, she's still skeptical of Tedros. And while that's happening, Tedros and Jocelyn have, again, I don't know if it's the worst sex scene I've ever seen. Cause again, the dolphin sex scene from Showgirls is steered there, but this is a nice, this is a solid two where he blindfolds her, steps away from her and just says, crudely sexual things to her in the least sexy way possible. I wanna grab you by the ass while I suffocate you with my and stretch that tiny little <sighs> Okay, look, <laughs> all right. I will say this, dirty talk can be cringe if you're not participating. But my God, the weekend doesn't make it any better. Oh boy. You know, now that I say that, it's actually not that surprising because he also makes like the least sexy, sexy music as well. So good, gotta say that she played a just drastically criminally horny. And the episode ends with, again, a very subtle and very, very long uh, bout of all of them singing together about dysfunctional families, how it breaks my mother's heart. I assume it's supposed to be like, oh, if my mother saw this, she would, it would break her heart, you know? That she's finding comfort in these people, in these very strange people. Yeah, they all sing that together. Also, somebody flat as hell. We don't like each other anymore. <laughs> Episode three. Hello. If I look different, it's because it's a different day and I'm here, ready, refreshed. 48% of my blood is Red Bull and Pepsi Zero. 
Let's get back into the foolishness. This episode starts with Jocelyn's titties in the morning. Like just her titties, like her face is obfuscated. You just see a spotlight on her titties. There's no purpose. Sam just really likes to zoom in on her ass and titties. Uh, this episode starts off with Jocelyn and Tedros going shopping. He says, come on, let's go. They drive down Rodeo in a convertible with Leia driving kind of as their henchman or that's how Tedros kind of treats her. And as they drive down the streets of LA with the top down, Tedros gives her head in daytime public as another weekend song plays. And the song again is another one of these incredibly on the nose songs. I think this is a song that certainly I think I would like out of the context of the show, but because they because they put it here, it's so f corny. Anyway, they go to a Valentino store. Outside of the store, she's being swarmed by fans, which leads me to wonder, did nobody see her getting head in the back of the, I mean, probably getting an indecency charge and becoming a sex offender probably isn't the best idea, but okay. He's like, buy this, buy this. This will look so good on you. Buy this, buy this. While he's like kind of telling her what to dress in, saying will look sexy to him, he then goes up to one of the workers and quote unquote intimidates him. Let me catch you looking at her again. I'll drag you down Rodeo. Stomp you. I'll curb stomp you. I'm sorry. I'll curb stomp you. Now, as cringy as this scene is, especially if taken out of context, it's hilarious out of context, dude. I said, oh, it is still cringy and off putting. And you could argue badly acted, but unfortunately there are people <laughs> like this who behave like this. So it's actually not that inaccurate. It's just cringy to see. So I'm not even gonna blame The Weeknd for his performance here. I will blame Sam though, because I think this is uh, the beginning of when I started to ask, what does Sam want from us? in regards to how we perceive Tedros. And I was seeing people kind of go back and forth about this particular scene, about whether or not how cringy and sad Tedros comes off is intentional. <laughs> I was seeing some people say like, he's supposed to look like a loser. He's supposed to not be intimidating. He's supposed to be a laughing stock. And sure, I guess you could read it like that, but I have several issues with that particular reading. Again, up until this point, they've been treating this mother like Dracula. They want us to be afraid of him. Two, do you really think The Weeknd would have taken on such a self-deprecating and self-aware character? Really? Do you really think? <laughs> and three, throughout this show, before this and after, they do nothing but present him as this charismatic leader, the the alpha, the dangerous and mysterious ghoul that can convince anyone of anything. And I'm sure that type of character comes with a level of insecurity because only an insecure person would feel the need to grasp at security like that in this very like maladaptive and dangerous way. But this show, um, is a piece of shit. Tedros is an incredibly two-dimensional character. They don't delve into him. They don't develop him. So all we're seeing is how people react to him. And that's how we're supposed to garner what he is. And what we see people around him doing is being intimidated. But the problem is the weekend as Tedros is not intimidating, partially because he's not a great actor, but also because Tedros is flat. He's a caricature of a bad guy. He's just a creep that everyone finds alluring for some reason. And we never delve really into why that is either. It's such a shallow and underdeveloped story that if we would have stopped showing them fucking all the time, we could have actually gotten to some point, uh, you know, learning about characters and understanding where this power he has lies because it doesn't make sense if you watch the show. It's like, this is just some guy. He's supposed to be this like God figure and it's just some dude. <laughs> Like, and that's very funny to me. And I saw a tweet that really surmised a lot of thoughts I've had about people who engage with Sam Levinson. I'm gonna say it right today. Levinson's work. There's this phenomenon where a lot of people watch his work and feel the need to overextend themselves to, <laughs> to contribute some form of meaning to work that he did not flush out, he did not create. And I think this is one of those moments that people are trying to superimpose meaning on top of some shit that 
Sam didn't even work that hard to do. Meanwhile, Leia calls Haim and Destiny to say what her concerns are in regards to Tedros. When Leia told them that there was an emergency, they went to her house immediately and they was gonna shoot it up. You know, they gang gang. But she was like, no, I don't mean like he barricaded the house or anything. I'm saying he's mentally taking over the house. He behaves and has said explicitly, like I'm running the show now. You think you have to ask Jocelyn for permission, but no, I'm the head of this now. We have have a scene that shows explicitly that audacity and also this shows an explicable love of slurs. Sure, but I still have to talk to Jocelyn. Are you f***ing with it? It feels like they say a random slur just because they know you're going to sleep and it's the only thing that'll make you go, what? But he's offended that Leia still feels like she doesn't answer to him, which she does not. She answers to Jocelyn. She's Jocelyn's assistant. He starts making like hiring and firing decisions. He fires her nutritionist um, after, he, admittedly he does get weirdly handsy, but it's also not his job to hire or fire anybody. He's like, you're fired, get the fuck out of here. And he's like, I don't, I don't answer to you. I answer to Jocelyn. He slaps him. I don't remember which order that happens in, but it does happen. And Tedros goes up to Jocelyn and he's like, are you gonna fire him? What are you gonna do? And she's like, I think, um, I don't think that this is working anymore. So she like fires him morosely. And again, <laughs> the weekend isn't convincing as a character. And he like stands there and he's supposed to be like posted up, like, uh huh, see what I did. He looks like more of a loser. And I don't believe that it's intentional. I really don't. It's just an accidental consequence of the weekend's bad acting, honestly. And this terrible script, too. Speaking of awful, uh, in this case, lines. This one was a choice. Um, I, I had a lot of uh, creative friends of mine say that this is when they decided that they refused to participate in the viewing experience of the show any longer. The executive dude, Andrew, calls Chaim saying that he wants to cancel the tour. We heard about her not being able to do the music video. She's obviously not mentally well. Like, let's just cancel it because I'm like, you're stressing me out. I'm incredibly nervous. I don't think that she's up to it. But instead of just saying that or any other idiom to display <laughs> Uh, nervousness, he says, shitting more blood than a kid at Epstein's Island. Now, this was the line that really sent me down that Sam Levinson knows that he can't write rabbit hole because what would drive someone to add this to a script? Right? Did he think it was funny? Considering stuff like this keeps popping up so randomly in the show and it, it, and it makes no sense to be there. I think he genuinely thinks this is his attempt at, at comedy. Also, I cannot stress that the show was rewritten over and over and over again. So much was taken out, so much was added, so many people undoubtedly are somewhere involved. It was edited and compiled together and that still made it to the show. Gives very like ninth grader trying to be edgy to make friends because they're uncomfortable at their new school. It has like, that's the humor. That's the energy I get from Sam Levinson. You're 40, dude, like seriously. And then right after that, in a beautiful display of whiplash, we get another, <laughs> we get another scene. This one was actually very funny to me. I, I don't know if it was supposed to be funny. I really don't. Maybe it was supposed to show like, yeah, Tedros is scary, but this shit cracked me up. Oh. Tedros and Jocelyn are in the uh, dressing room of the Valentino store. She's like, since when do you have so much opinion on what I wear? And he was like, I think you don't have taste. And she just says kind of cheekily, oh, I think it's cause you're gay. It came out of nowhere. It was the most random shit. But something, something that sent me over the edge is that they do a continuous shot to Tedros' face and it smiles so it appears. And I'm like, what the f is going on? And his response to that is, I ain't gay. And then they start f***ing in the change of room. So they're going at it. She won't let him finish inside her. So she walks off and he has to finish himself. And that was also some, how do you, how are you a bad actor while jacking off? And then he's like, oh, what do I do with the splooge in my hand? And he wipes it off on a dress. When they get back to the house, uh, Destiny and Chaim are still there and they're there to kind of, well, one, meet Tedros, get a feel for him and kind of 
question him a bit, kind of get a feel for him a bit. They ask him where he's from. He says he's from LA. They're like, no one's from LA. Where are you from? He was like, no, I was born and raised here. Destiny's like, oh, so was I. Where'd you go to school? And he was like, I wasn't a great student. And she's very kind, but you could tell that she's kind of looking for some information. I didn't finish school either. I got kicked out. Why? Beating fake ass bitches asses. <laughs> <laughs> I like her. She's very Taurus coded. <laughs> That's the energy I get from her. But Chaim and Destiny tell them that they've bought her some time. So she really needs to focus. You need to make music. I need hits. I need three hits in two weeks. And Tedros is like, I got you. I'm gonna introduce her to some big producer that he knows. He comes to the club, I got her. So they say, all right, we getting going. And for some reason, they lie to Leia about how they feel about him because they don't like him. But they tell Leia, oh, I love him, he's great. But they get back to the car, they're like, something's up with that dude. My mama always told me to never trust a man with a rat tail. But yeah, the show keeps going. He gives her head again. There's a lot of head going on in the show. And while they're canoodling, Diane is taking to Jocelyn's set. She's recording the song that she was supposed to come out with, but couldn't do because she had a breakdown. Eventually Tedros comes up for air long enough for them to make music eventually. And now Tedros has kind of moved into the house as well as his followers. When did, what the, when did that happen? When you let them move in? They came over like three days ago. They live here, child? Oh my God. But anyway, while talking to uh, Chloe, the real pixie, fly in one. They talk a bit about her mother, how hard it was when she found out that she had cancer. And this scene is not bad. Again, if taken out of the context of the show, this could have worked in some way. It really gets again to the emotion that Jocelyn's mother was a big impact, not just to her as her child, but also to her as an artist and she's kind of floundering because she doesn't know what to do without her. But again, God forbid we have some form of story progression because we got to get back to Tedros. Tedros goes up to Xander. If you recall, Xander is uh, Jocelyn's creative director. And he goes up to the guy and he's like, yo, your creative direction sucks. And Xander is like, I ain't even gonna hold you. You ain't wrong. Then why don't you do a good job. <laughs> like, why, why aren't you doing a good job? At the end of the day, no matter what idea I come up with, cause I come up with great ones, I always have to listen to Jocelyn or the record label, but I can never do what I'm fully capable of. So Tedros asks him, hey, if you had carte blanche, pardon, if you had carte blanche. All right, let's say you had carte blanche, right? Look, I pronounce things wrong all the time, but I'm also just one person in this room. <laughs> the fact that someone wrote that line, let you say it and did not say, hey dude, you pronounced that incredibly wrong and continued going and it made it to the show <laughs> is truly astounding. I don't think they took more than one take of any scene of the show. And it had me sitting there second guessing myself. I was like, have I been pronouncing carte blanche wrong this whole time? <laughs> and no, I haven't, I, I pronounce it the way English speakers do. Then I looked it up. I was like, maybe this is the French pronunciation. Carte blanche. No, it's, it's just wrong. And so I started to sit there and I was like short circuiting. I was like, okay, am I gonna sit here and really try to do the thing that Levinson fans do? I'm like, is this supposed to mean something? Is this supposed to be like indicative of him not being particularly smart in like the book smart sense? Stuff like this never comes up again. I never see something that would hint at this like it does right here. So I genuinely just think he said it wrong and no one corrected him and they put it in the show. Y'all not real. But anyway, he asks, if you could do whatever you want, what would you do? And Xander is like, well, they keep trying to turn her into this artificial bad girl. What I would do is take the photo and make it her album cover. <laughs> and Tedros thinks that's hilarious. And it's a great idea um, and says, hey, that's awesome. Let's do some coke. Meanwhile, Isaac is recording something and suddenly with no uh, foreshadowing, nothing to build us up to this moment, Jocelyn is I the shit out of him and nothing ever comes of this. She's just doing this in this specific scene. He asks her to sing with him and she's like, no, I'm not gonna sing with you. Oh no, you're not allowed to say no. Bitch, I can say whatever the fuck I want. This is my house. Y'all some squatters. They're like, Tedros always says that saying no is denying yourself an experience. And sometimes the most valuable to us artistically are the ones that are 
the most painful. For instance, they say, Robert Plant, who made a song about his son that died when he was five years old. And just imagine, if that little nigga didn't die, we wouldn't have great things to listen to. He's like, okay, then if you can't say no to anything, I dare you, Isaac, to go up to Ramsey, whoever the fuck that is, I assume another family member, but we don't meet them all. There's, there's also just random people there all the time too. There's only like two of them to actually say anything. Go up to Ramsey and kiss her. And he does it without question. She's like, would you kiss her if Leia was here in the room? And I'm supposed to assume that they're like dating to some degree now. And he's like, yes. So she's like, would you kiss me? And apparently that's where he draws the line. If he were to kiss her, Tedros would kill him. I'm like, dude, you like a foot and a half taller than him. You are fine. And that night they have a dinner together with all of the family members. Again, half of these n I have no clue who they are, but, and Jocelyn is like super emotional. Even though she met these people like four days ago, she's like, oh my God, it's been so great to have you guys here. Like I've never felt so connected. Blah, blah, blah. And at this dinner things, theoretically start to get very tense. If it were well-written, it's just really dumb. Tedros brings up how Xander said that maybe the pick as her album cover would be a good idea. And Jocelyn says she'll think about it, but she's not particularly wanting to do it because she wants to be taken seriously as an artist. And this starts this whole weird overstepping conversation where Tedros, the person with no music career of his own, telling her what she needs to do to be a better artist. And she's like, I'm not a rookie. Who are you? You're the one new to music. Who are you to tell me <laughs> what to do? But he's like, well, what you make is superficial. And the reason you don't like what you make is because you don't make anything authentic. The dark shit that you've been through is so relatable. Why don't you just hone in on that. And this is where we go into the rabbit hole of the mother. Jocelyn's mother was very abusive in a way that was very visible to everyone around her. Despite this being an obviously very sensitive conversation, Tedros says, I don't give a fuck about your feelings or propriety. I'm gonna dig at that information. He pushes to know more about her trauma in a way that's very intrusive and coercive. She talks about how her mother's favorite weapon of choice, so to speak, was a hairbrush that she would use to beat her until she broke skin. You didn't fight back? Hello? No. Why not? What? what? Hello? Is there a part of you that wonders if the reason you're stuck is because your mother's not around? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you miss it? Getting hit? The motivation it gave you. Sometimes. What the f is going on? And if this conversation weren't awful enough. He then tells her to go get the brush that your mama beat you with. And then he takes her upstairs as they play more fucking weekend music. Never understood why mama cried. And then commences to do some type of uh, arguably sexual BDSM scene where he beats her in front of all of the other members of the family and interspersed between that scene of her like writhing in pain and crying. They show him bathing her the next morning and washing away the pain of the day before. And the episode ends with her turning to him and saying, thank you for taking care of me. And this episode was particularly disgusting, not because of impact play, I've been there, done that. Uh, <laughs> to use your abusive dead mom's weapon of choice is certainly a choice. And this is where I was like officially losing faith that this show was going to have anything to say, we're in a very interesting position right here. Depending on how you end the show, how you go from this episode, we'll decide how disgusting the scene actually is. Because obviously Tedros is supposed to be a bad guy. He's supposed to be playing with her traumas. In a way, taking the, the empty space left by her abusive mother. He's coming in to be a new abuser, yada, yada, yada. Um, but there is this sort of liminal space we're in at this point where if they don't take a swift turn very soon, it will come off as fetishization of abuse, fetishization of the broken woman, instead of just showing like the slow subjugation of someone t into a cult. How did she fall into the same abusive patterns that were demonstrated by her parental figures? So theoretically, this show could have still been saved if they actually gave a f <laughs> at 
all about what they're actually doing. Are we fetishizing abuse or are we trying to illustrate the very seductive nature of entering into a cult and how it leaves you open to abuse, especially because again, she already is very vulnerable to that. Knowing Sam, he will not handle it well. And rest assured, psych. <laughs> episode four. So this episode again begins with more on the nose, the weekend music. I'm just a jealous guy. While this music is playing, they show the housekeepers talking amongst themselves about how awful Tedros is, as well as his crew and how like messy they leave the house. They're always having these crazy parties. They say he's awful, it's probably cause he's short. And I laughed, that made me laugh. Um, <laughs> I've said it before, I'll say it again. As a tall woman, I have plenty of experience with short men. Again, not all of them are bad, but there's a very particular type of short dude and he's so obviously terrible. I don't know how tall Sam Levinson is, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's on the short side cause this is just some short shit. But Destiny has been doing some research on Tedros and apparently she has discovered a bunch of stuff about him. Namely, his real name is Mar Mauricio Jackson and he was originally in Hawaii and he has been arrested on various DV charges, torture, uh, holding his ex-girlfriend hostage for three days. And Destiny, again, being the only good character, is like, I don't think we should kill this mother I was like, yes, to the point. Again, very Taurus coded. Every Taurus woman, particularly that I know, their knee jerk to any problem is to say, so let's go beat their ass. And it's the funniest shit. And Chaim is like, maybe we need to do something else. We gotta see what's going on. We gotta infiltrate. Later that day, uh, Tedros brings that producer dude that he wanted to come over. So they start making the music and it's of course very subtle. The opening line is something along the lines of, I don't wanna decide things on my own. I don't wanna decide things for myself. But while they're making music, Destiny comes to the house, staking out, seeing what's going on here. And while she's there, she ends up meeting Chloe. And uh, it's very weird. She's randomly giving her impromptu vocal lessons. Tongue wants to retreat. Oh. So that's why it's covered. Ooh. Destiny ends up asking her how she met Tedros. And she says, uh, I was a heroin addict. That was funny. That was very funny. Actually, that one was very, very funny. <laughs> and she was living on the street and she had nowhere to go. And he picked her up and gave her a place to stay credits him for saving her life. And this seems to be like a reoccurring theme that if we, we only see two people talk about how they met Tedros and this is the reoccurring theme going on there. How old are you, Chloe? So, or 18. So the chick that we've been seeing butt naked and running around in a thong all day is a minor. Sounds about Sam Levinson. Destiny comes into the studio and listens to what Jocelyn and Tedros have so far. And she's like, it's good, but you need to go there. And Tedros is like, I have just the thing. So he ties a scarf around her eyes and makes her sing into the mic while he finger fucks her in front of everybody in the studio. Eventually we return to Diane. Remember Diane? Remember how, <laughs> remember how Jenny had an arc somewhere in <laughs> here? Well, <laughs> we back to her. She is going into the record, the record executive's office and they're telling her the offer that they have for her in regards to her debut single. They're offering her the song that Jocelyn was going to release originally. And so she's super excited about it, but she's scared and she doesn't wanna betray Jocelyn. Didn't y'all set up Diane to be sort of a rival in the first like, two episodes. She wouldn't be in the wrong necessarily for taking it, considering it was offered, especially if she's supposed to be like the villain and she's in cahoots with Tedros, right? Isn't she supposed to be like a weird competitor for this uh, rat tail, greasy looking cause love? I, I'm confused by the solidarity. Is she supposed to be a rival or is she supposed to be like girl power? I don't know. <laughs> Make it make sense. Y'all set her up to be a backstabber. Ah, y'all came right. Oh my God. Back to Destiny, who after kind of observing the weirdness with Tedros uh, exhibition kink, she reports back to Haim and she's like, it's some weird kinky shit going on here. But low key, there's a bunch of very talented people here. I'm observing him at this point. He's really doing weird shit, but he's getting hits out of her. Mind you, they don't show a whole lot of the things that he does to bring artistry out of people. They just want to show all the weird sex shit. Am I supposed to assume that he's doing weird sex shit with everybody to get here? Who knows? That sounds very cult-like. So while that's going on, we're listening to another one of the family sing. What did you do? 
Again, this is another example of confirming that this show just wants to find assault dangerous and sexy. I think we kind of reached that conclusion by now, moving on. Oh, this is funny because while Destiny's on the phone with Chaim, she's talking about Chloe and she's like, this girl, she makes these amazing songs. And if you would listen to it, it's like, it makes you want to give yourself to God. And it's funny because we hear the song, <laughs> like we can hear it. It's it's fine. It's giving very, uh, welcome to my kitchen. <laughs> Got bananas and avocado. <laughs> but, and that's just a reoccurring thing too, because they'll talk about like how amazing these musicians are. And they're fine. They're good. But the way that they describe them is this like extraterrestrial, out of this world talent that is only once in a generation. And I'm like, Girl, I've seen people sing better at karaoke and a random Thursday. Later, Leia, as usual, is the voice of reason. And she's talking to Isaac and she's like, I think it's really fucked up that we're all just sitting here watching her get assaulted, Jocelyn get assaulted in front of all of us and no one's saying anything because they want to make money. And Isaac is like, well, that's just Tedros's process. Like she's not even a human being. No, she's not a human being. She's a star and stars belong to the world. No. All my life, I've been very pro star saying F you. I wish a mother would say what I do as a job makes me no longer a human. So we can just do whatever to you. Assault, you don't own your body. But a lot of people really do think that way. And I find it very disturbing. And it's one of the reasons why I've never understood why people want to be famous, um, but okay. Later, Tedros overhears Xander singing in the shower and confronts him like a fucking bad omen. <laughs> what the f is the shot? Oh my God. <laughs> Again, it's another one of those, like, like he's this mythical devil being. Again, I really think they want us to be scared, but he just looks so dumb. And Tedros is like, I overheard you singing. Why don't you sing anymore? And Xander's like, well, it's complicated. Well, Jocelyn told me that the reason you don't sing is because you tore your vocal cords, but you sound fine now. So either you're all healed or you're lying. Jocelyn also told me that her mom was the one that outed you when you were 13 and this made you give up singing. And even after that, you moved in with Jocelyn and her mom. And Xander's like, yeah, I didn't know she did it until I was already moved in. We don't know anything about Xander and Jocelyn's relationship. We don't know how they met each other. We don't know why he was living in their house. We don't know anything about their closeness. Are they related? Are they family friends? Did they go to school together? We don't know anything. And do you think they're gonna tell us? No, cause we gotta have more Tedros. We go straight into an erratic tirade by Tedros where he tells the whole family to get up, stand up straight as if they're like soldiers. And he does this whole speech about the root of the word family is famulus, uh, meaning servant. And I found that very funny because I was like, you found the Latin base for words, but you couldn't look up carte blanche. This also cements that I think that scene was accidental. I think he's supposed to be, he's supposed to be intelligent. We're supposed to see him as a mastermind. He calls Xander to step forward, which he is hesitant to do. Feeling a sense of danger, Xander tries to make a run for it, but is eventually caught. Jocelyn is like, isn't this a bit extreme? Tedros is like, he betrayed you though. And this is in reference to Xander being around when Jocelyn was getting beaten by her mother while, while they were growing up. Tedros seems to have some particular ire towards Xander saying like, why didn't you do anything about it? As if he could, he was a child himself, but okay. But he's like, I'm gonna get back at Xander cause this is my way of showing my devotion to you. And Jocelyn's goofy ass is like, oh my God, really? He's like, yes, all you have to do is tell me if he's lying. So they bring Xander back. They tie him up, nearly suffocate him, put a shot collar around his uh, neck. And Xander's like, Jocelyn's mom told me not to say anything. And Jocelyn's like, that's not true. And then suddenly, in a way that the script did not make space for, Xander is suddenly anti Jocelyn to such a degree that he's like, she's a monster. She's a master manipulator, like her bitch mother. He's screaming, vein coming out of his neck. They're going back and forth. She's like, shock him again, shock him again. He's like, her mom made me sign a contract where he agreed to not sing because it would take focus away from Jocelyn. Eventually they go back and forth doing that until Xander is like, okay, okay, fine, I was lying. And I was like, girl, you got two episodes to make that make sense because it don't. And then we just drop that and we go on to the next scene, uh, back to them making terrible music, uh, showing it to Destiny, who I guess <laughs> stopped 
caring about Tedros as an immediate threat anymore because again, they're making good music. So, well, she cares a little bit, but the, she seems to have missed the urgency that she had before. Cause later she talks to Jocelyn about him alone. I've noticed some things about Tedros. Like how long have y'all known each other? Like what's going on there? She was like, oh, we're just getting to know each other. She was like, I noticed he got some tats. Like I noticed his tattoos and she's like, they're cool or whatever. They're prison tats. You know, he spent some time in jail and she's like, oh, <laughs> okay, for what? She's like, oh, he had this like crazy ex and they had this very tumultuous, like really toxic relationship. And he like choked her in self-defense. She punched him in the face and he hit her back and she made it seem like he abused her. <laughs> and, and Destiny, again, she's so funny to me. She's the only good character. She's just looking at her like, he choked her? And it's saying it's self-defense. Jocelyn keeps going, because apparently there's more. He also claims that an artist he was working with tried to extort him, and she got a bunch of people together to call him their pimp. And he went to jail for six years for that. And it was just all such a drummed up charge. Uh-huh. Later that night, there's this very strange and kind of ambiguous scene, but Xander is still tied up and Isaac comes down and bathes him. Like just his lower body, he wipes it off with a wet cloth and it feels rapey to me. Um, also, they never come back to this anyway. And there's never any like animosity between them. There's never any, they don't even talk, I think, after this to each other explicitly. Like it's, it's moving on. Later, Tedros goes to Jocelyn and he's like, I just got the best idea. You should tell everybody like publicly that your mom abused you. That would really sell some tickets to that concert. She does this tear filled message to her fans explaining the abuse she went through with her mother, particularly the hairbrush thing, explicitly the hairbrush thing. And after that, I guess public perception is really good for her. So they're like, let's throw a party. And Tedros is a dick to Leia like he always is. But this time, for some reason, it actually causes a conflict between Jocelyn and Tedros. What changed? I have no clue. Later, while talking to Chloe, both her and Jocelyn notice that Diane has come to the party. And Chloe says something in passing about how she figured that she wouldn't come because I thought she'd be mad at you, you Jocelyn. And she's like, well, why would she be mad at me? And she's like, oh, because of Tedros, because she really likes Tedros. And like when she brought you to the club that time, she didn't think that you would like sleep with him. This information makes her upset with Tedros for some reason. This is the catalyst where suddenly Jocelyn is like, wow, Tedros is a bad guy. Fuck how he took over your house, how he's doing this weird abusive sex shit to you and possibly who knows how many other people. He moved a cult into your house, took over your career, took over your life. You're upset that he asked someone who knew you if, if he could meet you? What? And suddenly she's no longer under Tedros's spell anymore. Be Speaking of Diane, she comes over to Jocelyn and says, and tells her that Nikki had offered her the song that was supposed to be hers, but she didn't want to take it without talking to Jocelyn first. Again, this weird solidarity that I wouldn't have expected considering, again, they set Diane up to be a rival. And Jocelyn is like, I don't wanna stand in your way of something like that, I don't wanna stand in your way, so feel free to have it. But still upset at Tedros, uh, Jocelyn decides to invite her ex-boyfriend over, Robert, who is like an actor or something. I have no idea who this dude is. After a second watch through, they mention him one time, the first episode flippantly, but we have not heard anything about this man at all this entire show. At first I was like, oh, is he the one that leaked the picture? But no, he's just an ex. We, By the way, we never find out who leaks the pictures, but she invites him over because it would make Tedros jealous. I guess because he didn't tell her that he had hooked up with Diane before. I gotta tell you, everybody I hooked up with, I don't understand. Tedros ends up going to Rob first though, offers him shots, gets very drunk, nearly vomits, gets belligerent, calls him the F slur. Huh? Doesn't everybody gotta take it up the ass to get these roles out here? Again, just a reminder, the show's still on everybody. Then he woos like Ric Flair and tries to box him. Out comes Jocelyn and she giddily greets Robert, um, says that she doesn't even know who this Tedros guy is 
and doesn't need to. They go off to do some freaky deaky shit in her room and Tedros comes to the door banging on it. And when he isn't successful at getting in, he sits down on the floor waiting outside their door. So Jocelyn just wants to fuck, but the Rob guy is actually halfway decent. He like wants to actually support her. Apparently he knew nothing of her mom's abuse and she's she's like, I don't wanna hear all that. So they do that while Tedros listens outside the door, tears sparkling in his eyes. On Rob's way out, Xander comes up to him with a random girl in a bikini and asks Rob if he would take a photo with her because she's a big fan. And he's like, sure, I'll do a quick one before my driver gets here. And she sits in his lap and gets very touchy feely. And he's like, obviously uncomfortable. He's like, oh no, this is not cool. But Xander takes the photos anyway. Then Rob leaves like, dude, delete those photos. Episode five, holy fuck, oh my God. Jocelyn is finishing up her last song and her and Tedros are obviously not on good terms. And it would seem that she uh, doesn't need him anymore. Babe, since when? The shift felt so sudden. The You're a f-ing con man and a fraud. I had to rewind because I thought I missed something. It felt like a whole like section of story just wasn't there. Again, all she learned is that he one of her dancers before he met her and he asked her to introduce them. A dancer that has only been on screen like three seconds for the whole show. So it's not like y'all close bitch. Not again, not even a rival mind you, just a person. Again, if we, if they hated each other, that would make sense to me. But that's the only information she needs to say, oh my God, Tedros is actually abusive. And she's strong about it. She's whole ass. I don't need you, you a bitch. She then fills in a bunch of information that I don't know where she got this information from. Again, they must have dropped that scene on the cutting room floor as well. Knew this like random backup dancer of mine and he saw that I followed her on Instagram and he'd been like obsessed with me for years, like back when he was in prison and stuff. This whole time he had this crazy plan and it worked. What plan, bitch? You explained nothing. Hey, I'd like to meet your friend. Bring her to a club is not the bad thing he did here. (laughs) What made you turn the corner was that he was interested in you before y'all met (laughs) and wanted to meet you. So when he found the opportunity, he he took it to meet you. Even more confusing. She is just upset with Tedros. She's like, you need to go. Your cult members though, they can stay. What? And in the show, because nothing else makes sense, they are now loyal to Jocelyn. Why? You've been brainwashing these motherfuckers for who knows how long. Baby girl was a heroin addict. One person that they met two weeks ago, who within the last 24 hours have has changed their opinion of you in a way that's completely independent of them. They have now completely shifted their devotion to this random woman. Y'all can't write and it's frustrating. The executive dude calls uh, Andrew and he's like, I'm nervous about the tour. I wanna have a meeting with you. I wanna see what you have. And she's like, sure, come by. And so she gets everyone to have a pep talk. All of the other family cult members that are still there. Tedros is still there for some reason because he just refuses to leave. And she's like, why are you still here? I was talking to them. I'm not talking to you. I don't need you. This vitriol that I'm like, huh? And once she gives like the little pep talk, she's like, everybody is gonna sing for him and we're gonna show him the tour that we're gonna do. Once she's gone, Tedros calls Xander over and he's like, did you notice how she didn't say that you're gonna sing for them? She's trying to make sure you don't overshadow her. You should show what you have. Jocelyn feverishly brushes her hair like she's been doing the whole show and Rob calls her, which she ignores. All the executives and managers come by. They are creepily greeted by the quote unquote family, which makes them immediately uneasy, especially the the Andrew guy. He calls for Jocelyn, but Tedros is there instead being just a complete crackhead. Berates Nikki, calling her a TikTok algorithm for stealing Diane from him without letting him know. I don't know how he found that out, but okay, he found that out too. But before things get too heated, Destiny is like, hey, um, Chloe, can you sing that song or whatever? And she sings, she's very Regina Spector, early 2010s indie darling kind of voice. That's what she sounds like. And they seem to really like her, but the main exec dude, Andrew, is still very off put. He's like, this is some cult shit. He also, again, very subtle references to Manson and how Manson and his people like, uh, 
basically took over someone else's house before. Do you know who else was really talented? Charles Manson. You know what else he did? He moved into Dennis Wilson's house and lived there for a year and a half. Meanwhile, Rob, the ex-boyfriend, is calling Leia saying, I didn't rip anyone at Jocelyn's house. What? What, what? Xander asked me to take a photo with this random girl and now she's telling the press that I ripped her. You have to tell Jocelyn to speak out against this because it didn't happen. Le <sighs> oh my God. Jocelyn comes down and she tries to calm down the exec dude who is not loving this weird cult shit that's going on. I'm a Jew, I'm anxious, it's in my DNA. Just an infinite well of humor, aren't you, Sam? But Jocelyn's down and she starts to introduce the next act who is Isaac, oiled up and in boxers and doing the whole like super weird fetishy thing. And they're all like super into him in this way that doesn't feel complimentary. It feels gross. <laughs> While he's singing again, in a way that we can hear, they call him like a modern day prince. <laughs> see maybe a D'Angelo, maybe. Prince can sing whatever the hell he doing, but he can't sing when doves cry. Leia goes up to Xander after asking him over and over to please talk to her in private. And eventually he finally does. And when she gets him to move over, one of Tedros's henchmen try to intimidate her. Can I talk to him by myself, please? And Xander is like, why? Mitch is family. Rob is being accused of sexual assault and the news about it is about to break. And he's like, Oh no, and he has that big movie coming out. Am I supposed to understand, fuck. Am I supposed to understand Xander's motives for falsely accusing Rob of Is it that Tedros convinced him to? What, because Tedros said he can sing? He also tied you up, almost killed you, tortured you with a shot collar, and was cool with you getting assaulted, presumably by Isaac. How do we get to the place that Xander is loyal to Tedros to the extent that he's, that he's fucking over a random person for him? Does he have an issue with Rob? We don't know. Next up to perform for the executives is that weird something in your drink girl. And while she's singing, there ends up being like a, like a split between the executives. Half of them are on pro Jocelyn side. And then Nikki is talking to Tedros like, I can tell that you are the reason they're like this. I need you to come over to my side. I wanna work with you. You called me a cunt. I could be your cunt. After the song is over, everyone in the room finds out about the allegations against Rob and how he got edited out of his movie that was just about to come out. And after that, Jocelyn is sure that Tedros had something to do with it. Tedros is like, well, I heard things about him being like gross and violent and I've heard stories. So then Tedros nods to Xander to say, hey, why don't you sing? Which also, I guess, illustrates that they were in cahoots for some reason. So and he sing a little ditty and it's another one of those things where they're like, oh my God, he sounds like when angels sing and it's just like a guy. Again, we can hear him. <laughs> and while he's singing, Jocelyn takes uh, Tedros out of the room to chew him out. I know you have something to do with these allegations. I know you know that they're not true. Get out of my house. And he says, he's not leaving. And she's like, I'll call the cops. And he was like, then I'll take you hostage. And they'll kill you. Not before I kill you first, bitch. And then he's like, Aren't you proud of Xander? He got his voice back. And I'm, I guess that's supposed to be impactful to me, but it's not. Jocelyn leaves him and goes to Chaim and says, hey, pay Tedros anything he asks for just to get him out of my life forever. Does that, takes Tedros. After he does some whole like monologue about him being the big bad wolf, I'll skip it cause it doesn't matter. And he takes him to a car where he offers him $500,000 to disappear. And Tedros is like, no, she's worth more than money. And he rips up the check and Chaim is like, okay, Time for plan B. While this is going on, Jocelyn is finally giving her performance. It's okay. Again, it's giving that like Lana Del Rey or that just general like 2018 to 2020 downer music. Um, The song's not bad. If it was on, I would listen to it. Her dancing is a lot. But once the performance is over, Andrew's like, oh my God, this was so amazing. It's the best music you've ever done. You needed to go through all that pain and your mom dying and everything. Oh my God, I'm so proud of you as a parental figure. He says, as a parental figure, I've never been more proud of you. Okay. And they love all of the family. So they're like, they're all going on tour. The tour is on. So everyone's super happy about it. And then just a bunch of shit happens. Again, Tedros was forced to leave the premises by her security. She has security? 
how your house get taken over and you got security, bitch? Leia quits her job. Kind of makes sense. I'd be over it too. All you motherfuckers get on my nerves. Nikki tells Diane that she can't release the song for some reason. And for some reason, when she walks out, Diane is like, oh, it was Jocelyn, wasn't it? And I, and I guess I'm supposed to assume it was Jocelyn. Again, I don't, I thought y'all were cool. Like, when did y'all know? <laughs> yeah, she's going on tour with the family people. And honestly, the songs they talk about singing sound depressing they're gonna sing that like that's my family song i'm like who wanna be in a stadium listening to your dysfunctional family stories i came to shake some ass also someone's still out of key <laughs> Just like the first episode where the executives were looking down at Jocelyn as she rehearsed, they are looking down at her now as she's in the stadium preparing for tour. Again, remark about how mental illness is sexy, saying that it's a gold mine. And most notably, they celebrate how they got rid of Tedros. Even Nikki, who was trying to work with him behind their backs. So, okay, the plan B that Chaim was gonna do was to go to that journalist from the very, 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 very beginning of the show. Instead of talking about Jocelyn, the things that you saw while she was trying to get her life together and she was kind of falling apart making music in the studio and recording her videos, instead of releasing that, release a piece about this random n named Tedros and his pimping charges. And she does it and it ends with, Tedros losing everything. His club, they're all laughing at him. They even say, oh my God, we ruined him. <laughs> they, they kind of make this seem as though he is being wrongfully crucified and humiliated. Like they took it too far to talk about the fucked up shit that he did. Like, I don't understand the emotional undercurrent. Just like the devil, when you call his name, here comes Tedros at the stadium. Jocelyn had asked him to come and saved for him an artist pass. He asked for a pass under the name Tedros and they're like, we don't know what that name is. So he says his real name, Mauricio Jackson. And they're like, oh yeah, it's under that. I don't know if that's supposed to be a power play. Like I know who you really are or whatever. Whatever. He gets his pass and when he walks into the backstage, he's greeted by Destiny, who is in a weird way, the person that gives him the most grace for some reason. They put you through the ringer. Good, I don't give a about anybody's past. But the question is, what are you going to do now? If you muff up and you hurt her, I will hunt you down like the mother dog you are and I will kill you. Out comes Jocelyn and suddenly Jocelyn and him are cool again and they missed each other. They're in her dressing room and he notices her brush and he's like, isn't this the brush that your mom used to beat you with? <laughs> yeah, it looks brand new. And then she turns to him slowly with a knowing smile. Sam, are you trying to insinuate that she lied about her mother beating her with a brush? That she lied about her mother being abusive? The entire fucking show made reference after reference after reference to the abuse. There were witnesses to the abuse that confirm it in various moments of the show. Of course, my mother was nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just such a horrible up situation that no one really knew what the right thing to do was. More disgusting up and depraved than your bitch of a mother. She was constantly super aggressively brushing her hair to show that that had some form of uh, meaningful torment for her. That was all made up. That's not how a twist works, Sam. You can't just turn her into a she knew all along. She manipulated, she's a mastermind when you haven't laid any foundation for that. Even in retrospect, I've seen the shit twice. You're telling me that this is just, ah, I'm a blood pressure. Ooh, it's getting hot. Why am I like, I'm temperature, I'm temperature hot. You're trying to tell me that she planned this all out. She planned to meet this random dude in the club with a rat tail who's gonna be like, I can help you improve your career by having abusive sex with you just to make her music better. Is that really what you're trying to say? That's your Shyamalan twist. Sam. Sam! Sam, you better answer me. She goes on stage and thanks her crowd who have come out, you know, to support her in her darkest time. And she's like, now, 
I would like to introduce you to the love of my life. And he comes out and everyone's super confused, including him, bewildered and kind of subjugated suddenly. She kisses him on stage as the crowd cheers. They play this as if this, uh, this is some kind of weird power play for her, as if she's won. He just got out of for being a pimp, an abuser. Now, right after, <laughs> right after, claiming how much you love him on a public stage. And you think this makes him look bad? I thought you were supposed to be Miss Master Manipulator. Always 12 steps ahead. This bitch stupid. Not only did he get outed for being a terrible person, apparently it impacted him enough that people knew him as an abuser and a cult leader and it ruined his business. How is you coming out and claiming this your victory? How is this the end of the show? What happened to the Diane arc? What happened to the album cover. Did they ever figure out who leaked it? Is Tedros working with Nikki or not? What happened to the ex and his rape allegations? I watched this shit and I got to the end of it and said, so nothing happened. No nothing. I sat through this entire show waiting for you to make a f***ing point. And the only point you ended with was Jocelyn is still in love with an abuser, but she's the real manipulator here somehow. What are you saying, Sam? But I have never watched a show and felt like I was being blue balled by the point. You mad too? She's upset. At least with Showgirls, whether you agreed with its methods or whether or not you believe it was successful or not, it had a fucking point. Something it was trying to say. But at the end of the show, I was like, so, Y'all just wanted me to watch an abusive dude be abusive and somehow by the end of it, he's the, the victim. And if not the victim, some type of sympathetic figure, especially when his comeuppance wasn't even on screen. It was told via expository dialogue when the execs were all together canoodling. <laughs> I'm at a loss for words. I, did y'all just want to record a kink? Like I'm dead ass, I'm frustrated, I'm angry. I've been sitting here for hours talking about this stupid ass show just to reach this. What was the I reason? Just explained, I just explained the reason. What was the reason, bitch? I took time before I completely wrote off the show because I said maybe it's on this tightrope between displaying abuse because abuse is a reality, but not something that the creator is like okay with or condones versus showing abuse because it's sexy which is just an awful thing to say. And this show somehow fell so deeply into the latter, only for Tedros to come out on the other side as this kind of demure, castrated figure. <laughs> Fuck it all, oh my God. Episode six? No, if you notice, this is the end of the show, um, which was very confusing to me, but much appreciated because originally when the show was talked about, it was supposed to have six episodes, they cut an episode. And maybe that's why the ending was so confusing. They obviously had to leave an episode's worth of things on the cutting room floor, which is strange because y'all kept all the scenes of them giving head, but okay, you gotta get rid of the plot. <laughs> okay, I'm not really gonna give it much leeway for that because at the end of the day, this is the show. This is what I have to consume and it's garbage. Regardless of what it coulda, woulda, shoulda been, this is what it is and it sucks. I will say though, one thing that I find very funny, and that is uh, the alleged ratings. I don't know how accurate this is, but I wanna, I, I wanna choose to believe that this is correct. I assume this is just the television views, um, not including streaming or something. But again, still, I just wanna choose to believe that this is how low the ratings were. And apparently the ratings never got over 232,000 views. Damn, that's most likely less than this video will have. Here I am yet again, always here to help small creators. All right, finally, my final thought, shit. So relieved that so many people decided to band together to not watch this show because it should not continue. It's not worth a hate watch. Peculiar mix of insecurity, ego, men that felt like they can get away with anything, but they didn't think that talent had to be involved. With that said, it does please me that two men high on the smell of their own farts made garbage that no one watched. If anything, maybe this will force Sam to write something good <laughs> and maybe the weekend to do something other than this. Maybe just not a character like this. Maybe, maybe you do better 
playing a dude who sings. <laughs> I don't know, maybe just something that didn't require you to, to, to act well, I don't know. The idol is all style, no substance, it's incoherent, it's full of plot holes. Most of the characters are deeply uninteresting and flat. Tedros is not convincing as a cult leader, some charismatic figure. He's just some loser in a way that I don't believe was intentional at all. As a matter of fact, the end screams that Jocelyn has somehow managed to get this dangerous man under her thumb that she is triumphant. And it's only a triumph if Tedros is supposed to be some big bad, this giant adversary. So I do believe that's what they thought they were making, a villain. So with that said, this video has been far too long. So I'm gonna end it with this, a request of sorts. Amy Simons, <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only one that's been asking you since this shit came out. Will you please uh, release your version of the idol. I've seen some uh, like floating pictures that were going around about what the show was supposed to be and the vibe looks completely different from this show. I understand if you decline, because if I were you, I'd also want to do, I would like to exercise myself from the entire debacle that is the idol. But if you were to ever release something, you could just name it something else. It's not like any of it was saved for the final product. Again, they keep making Star is Born type movies every four years, you know? I don't know, I just really wish we would have seen that story that you were promised to make. So if you were ever to create it, I'd be more than happy to support, so. And I know I'm not alone in that. Whew. And that is the end of my video on the idol. Thank you, thank you. I cannot go to bed because I have to edit it. <laughs> if you like this video, feel free to like this video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram and Twitter. Oh, also threads now. All of which are Kenny JD. I forgot, I released a song uh, today as a filming. So if y'all wanna listen to it, cause people are always mad at me cause I don't tell you when I release songs or a lot of people don't know that I make music. So if you wanna check it out, look up Kenny, that's me. And I will see you guys next time.